from the busyness of our lives. In the midst of the world that holds the promise of spring and new life, let us hear the story. Let us experience the darkness. God of light, God of shadow, in our time together this evening, keep us aware of your presence in the darkness. Help us to find this tragic story meaning for our lives and keep the fire of hope alive in our hearts. We worship in the name of Jesus of Nazareth who lived with great passion for your way and whose death is near. Amen. Psalm 123, to you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. As the eyes of servants look at the hands of their master, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have had more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than its fill of the scorn of those who are at ease and of the contempt of the proud. Why didn't God save Jesus? From his fate? Did God want Jesus to suffer? Does God cause the suffering in our world? Is God so weak that salvation is only possible through violence? Or does our world cause its own violence? Are the world's people in defiance of God 
the ones responsible for nailing human beings to crosses? Is our world so weak that we think salvation comes only through violence? I fear it may be so. Lord, have mercy on us. Kyrie eleison. For all of the times we place our faith in violence and not love, have mercy. For all of the times we place our faith in vengeance and retribution and not compassion and restoration, have mercy. For all of the times we place our faith and authoritarian power, sheer might, accompanied by systems that dominate and humiliate, that exclude and kill. Have mercy. Kyrie eleison. I'm reading from the 130th Psalm. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. 
Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. I love the Psalms. The writers give us an invitation to walk deeply into the places of our lives that are hard, that are painful and difficult. Tonight we are invited to sit with death. Death is part of our humanity. It's part of our shared story. But the feelings and conversations that death evokes in us are scary. They are overwhelming. They are uncertain. There's resistance, fear, and grief. There's so much. And too often, we don't have the places where we're invited to hold those feelings or even permission to just name them out loud. Too often, we have to hide them. We explain them away with reasoning that is lacking when really there are just, there are no simple answers, right? Tonight we're invited to cry out, out of the depth of our being. Tonight we are invited to remember Jesus' death, and we cry out. We cry out because Jesus was murdered by a governmental structure that couldn't handle his message that disrupted political structures that sought to oppress people who were marginalized, marginalizing specific bodies and people of socioeconomic classes. So tonight we remember and we sit with death. The story of death, of crucifixion, of a public execution, of a murder. It's a story of a leader of a nonviolent resistance. He challenged unjust systems and the structures of his day because of his commitment to reimagining how we could live together as co-creators with God's story of love and abundance, to be with the Christ, the Spirit, with creation, transforming the story of life, death, and life from death. Tonight, we're invited to sit with stories of crucifixion that continue even in our day. Stories of women, women who are disempowered in specific places, and we know too well in our world, some where there are barriers on reproductive justice. Anytime we've heard our LGBTQ and I neighbors when their bodies have been condemned and it's been claimed as gospel. When we've struggled to talk about white supremacy and name it and change those structures, as we struggle to agree on how to care for creation, for our home, and truly be the co-creators, to be the ones we were called to be, to name and claim the goodness of all creation. And out of that, to help create those pathways for all to live and know their fullness, we are called to bravely talk about death and sit with death. There are so many things that we're never going to fully know. And this story, the one that we've told so many times, does not have a simple explanation or a simple ending for personal salvation. It's so much more. We can begin to see the structures that executed Jesus' life, and we can cry out for the injustice of his day and the injustices that continue to permeate in our lives and in our community. As we tell this story tonight, I'm reminded of the words from Father Richard Rohr. He reminds us, it is not God who is violent. We are. 
It is not God that demands suffering of humans. We do. God does not need or want suffering, neither in Jesus nor in us. So tonight, may we bravely cry out from the depths of our being, daring to hold this story, knowing God is aching with us in the depths of suffering in all places, in all times. May it be so. I'm reading from Luke 23, verses 32 through 43. Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the school, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one to his right and one to his left. Then Jesus said, Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by, watching, but the leader scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, 
if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have the same, we indeed have been con condemned justly. For we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Can it be? Can it be that on a cross someone would give of himself for us? For us. But why? What is it in this world that we have done to deserve such grace? For like Peter, we say that we will follow the teachings, that we will live the life of Christ, that we will never turn away, but then, as quickly as we can, we deny when times get tough and when we get pressured. Like the criminals that hung beside Christ on the cross, when things start to look bleak, we turn Take me with you, Christ. Bring me into your kingdom. We ask for safety. We ask for help. What is it that we do in our day-to-day -day lives which makes us think that we deserve the love which Jesus shows on this day? For we do not always welcome the stranger. We keep them at a distance. We do not always feed the hungry, but we make sure we are fed. We do not always clothe the naked, but we take clothes from others. We do not always accept the outcast, yet we expect to be accepted ourselves. Why should we be given this gift? And it is because and only because of the amazing love that Christ shows for us. For even as he dies, he speaks on our behalf. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. We do not know what we are doing, even when we have the greatest example set for us. We continue. To falter. But because of this amazing love, this love personified that gave all for us, we know salvation and we know life beyond this one. Amazing love given and yet not always deserved. Jesus dying for us showing us how to live in this world, showing us what it means to love. And can it be? And can it be that someone would give their life for us? And the answer is, of course. For all his life, Jesus taught us this one truth over and over again. God loves the world. Jesus loves the world and will give all for us. And all that is asked in return is for us to receive the love given and give it on to others we meet.
The scripture reading is from Luke chapter 23, verses 44 through 49. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed and the curtain in the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly, that was an innocent man. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for this spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. God had sent Jesus. God had sent Jesus in the name of love, in the name of peace, in the name of justice. God's gift of love to a suffering and broken people. And now, that gift of love stands displayed on a cross, suffering and broken himself. God's gift that would free people from rejection, from oppression, and from violence now stands displayed on a cross, a victim of that same rejection, oppression, and violence. The book of Luke describes Jesus' pain and suffering, and it tells how those around him, right up to creation itself, suffer alongside him. The crowds look on in anguish. The temple's curtain tears in two. The sun's light fails for three hours. Creation itself suffers to the core. The anthem and no bird sang by Douglas Wagner recognizes the pain at the cross felt by Jesus, felt by those around him, and felt by creation itself. It imagines how creation's suffering extends to the birds and how With the weight of everything going on around them, the birds cannot even muster a song. It reminds us that God's gift of love, justice, and peace comes to be and suffer with those who, with the weight of it all, cannot even muster a song. God's love flourishes by being with those who suffer, even as creation itself suffers, even as no bird sang.
Please join me in a spirit of prayer. God of mystery and wonder, because we know the ending of this story, it is tempting for us to ignore the darkness of this day. It is tempting to go about our business as usual. It is tempting to move too quickly to the dawn of Easter morning. But give us courage and strength on this day to live for a while in the darkness, to set aside comfort and pleasure, to feel the darkness in which so many of your children dwell, the darkness into which your son Jesus entered. As we reflect on the frailty of Christ, remind us of the frailty of all life. As we cringe at the suffering of Christ, make us mindful of suffering throughout the world. As we remember the death of Christ, increase in us the awareness of our own mortality. Gracious God, on this day of darkness, let us remember that life does not end with death. Like a seed that is buried to bring forth life, remind us of the mystery of what lies beyond physical death and increase our hope that from the darkness and death of this day will come light and life. Amen. And now the story has been told. And we return to the world where we live and wait and watch. For the hope that defies despair. For the life that defies death. For the beginning 
that defies the end. While we wait, while darkness envelops us, let us remember that we are not alone. Let us go in the assurance that God has not and will not abandon us. Thanks be to God. Amen.